be seated. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Father, you've heard our, our cry, you've heard our, our praise, our prayer, that you would pour out your spirit on us, that you would fill us again, that you would renew us, that you would wake us up from our sleep. raise us up out of our graves and have Christ shine on us anew. Shine on us today, Jesus, with your light. Come into the dark places um, in our world, in our community, and in our minds, in our hearts. Free us from oppression. Protect us from the evil one. Give to us grace where we, where we thought we'd reach the end of, of, of the reaches of grace. Remind us of who we are in you, dearly loved children of God. Every one of us, a child of God and a person of worth. Speak to us a message through your scripture and um, through me, the, your, your messenger in this moment, God, a word that, um, that we pray uh, we could hear from your heart to our hearts. Pray for healing in our land healing of those whom we love who are suffering physically, emotionally, spiritually. We're here today, God, to say we need you and we love you. We pray together the prayer you taught us. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see you and to welcome you to Providence Church. I welcome our 8 o'clock online worshipers and appreciate your faithful uh, joining us week after week after week. Uh, my name is Jacob. I'm one of the pastors here, and, and we are truly glad that each of you are here. I want to invite you, if you're able to, uh, to stand again, and we're going to say together uh, what is called the Apostles' Creed. And uh, we do this from time to time here. If it's new for you, you might just want to listen to it. Uh, but it is a, a thing that the church does, which is we say what we believe. So even in the midst of a, a week where you may have had a lot of things go on, we can say this and join together. So I invite you to say uh, what we believe together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I promise it'll be for longer than a minute this time. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to let you know, uh, Angela mentioned it in the introductory video, uh, something that's starting next week, a series we're starting that's called Practicing the Way. Uh, and you're, so you're going to be hearing a lot more about that, but it's, it's going to be a big emphasis over the course of the year. And the heart of it really is, as we've sensed over, especially over the last couple of years, a real desire among the people who come to Providence Church to go deeper in their relationship with Jesus. What would it mean to walk more closely with Jesus? Uh, and the way that we're going to look at that this year is by practicing the things that Jesus practices. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And some of the early followers of Jesus were actually called the way. And so what we'll be doing over the next several, uh, six, seven weeks is a series on Sunday called Practicing the Way. But I wanted to let you know specifically today about Mondays in February, four Mondays in February, where we're going to come in this room. We've never done this before, but the room will look different. We're going to have tables set up. We're going to eat a meal together. Uh, we're going to learn from some other people and begin practicing together some of the core practices that Jesus practiced in his life. I know that's kind of vague. I'm going to tell you much more about it. But the heart of it is, if you feel and you're like, I know I'm one of those people that wants to go deeper. 
And I want to walk with some other people through that. Just go ahead and block those Monday nights off in February. We'll have Providence Kids running at the same uh, time. It's something different here that we've ever done, uh, but we believe something that God is calling us to. So that's mainly for your calendar for February. Uh, Our scripture today is from Ephesians chapter 6. We've been walking through Ephesians 5, and now we've moved into chapter 6. So I want to read this passage to you, and then at the end of it, we will give God thanks for his word. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this morning, I have a claim that you can stake, okay? An action that you can take, and an insight that will wake you up, okay? I have a claim that you can stake, an action that you can take, and an insight that will wake you up. We've been studying through Ephesians chapter 5. We've just come to this passage in Ephesians uh, 6. And it's one of, uh, I, wouldn't, I'm not, I was going to say one of my favorite passages. Uh, more, better said, it's a, it's a passage that God always keeps bringing me back to. I don't know if you have any of those kind of scriptures in your life where it's like, God, why do you always keep bringing me back to this? If you do have that, I would say to you, pay attention. Because this passage of scripture for me is the one that I most easily forget. And it is the one when I remember it, I find the most power, the most clarity when I'm really confused. And it's sort of just a word that pulls me back to something that God wants me and I think us to see with spiritual eyes. First of all, this though, our, our verse for the year from Ephesians 5, you know, a couple pages back in this, from this scripture is this, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. It has been my prayer that this verse would begin to wake us up, begin to wake me up. I believe that there are parts of us, parts of people in this room that feel like they are dead. And some of you know, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you were, weren't able to sleep last night. Some of you are like, I barely made it through the week. Some of you had some things that used to be so alive in you that now feel so dead. And this scripture is a spiritual awakening scripture to say that we could actually wake up and there could be dead parts of you that you thought were dead for good that could rise from the grave. There could be dark places in your heart where Christ could shine. So wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. And then we come to this point where what I'm going to call it this morning is a claim that you can stake. And it is this, Ephesians chapter six says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. What hit me this week in reading this is it does not say that strength is on the way. It doesn't say get ready to be strong. It doesn't say you can count on some good things coming your way. It says be strong. (laughs) It says you can be strong right now. You can claim strength in this moment. So I've been using this phrase, which isn't uh, one we use all that often, is you can, you, this is a stake that we can claim. I looked up the uh, origin of that, you know, staking your claim. And it is an American phrase uh, that comes from around the mid 1800s when people were rushing out west, pioneers or prospectors, they would actually come to an area of land. They would say, this is my land. I believe there could be something good that is within it. And do you know what they would do? They would stake their claim. They would actually put a stake in the ground on four corners of a piece 
of land. And then on the inside of it, they would say, everything within the stakes is mine. I'm claiming it. I'm actually staking my claim. And that's what I think this verse is for us today. It's not one of those like, man, I hope that's going to happen. Or I'm really looking forward to the day. It is no. Be strong, God is saying. Be strong in this moment. You can claim it. You can stake it off as yours. Most of the time, I'm hoping to be strong. Most of the time, I'm I'm thinking, you know, maybe there's going to come a day when I'm going to be that which I'm hoping that I will be. But we're being uh, awakened to spiritual truth that says, why don't, uh, this is what I heard this week, why don't you be strong right now, Jacob? Why don't you be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power? It's not a future promise. It is a stake that you can claim or a claim that you can stake. I get it mixed up, but you know know what I'm saying. It reminds me of what God said to Joshua. He said to him, be strong and courageous. He said, be strong and courageous. Do you know what Joshua was doing? He was a pioneer. He had just been handed the, uh, the, the, the leadership role of a group of prospectors, if you will. He thought that Moses would be the one that would take them in. Everybody did. Moses was their leader. But suddenly it was Joshua who was getting staked off a claim that he was going to be the leader to lead the people of God into the promised land. And God said, be strong, Joshua, in this moment. Be strong in this moment and be courageous. He said, I will give you every place where you put your foot. He said, meditate on my word day and night. God gave him some some things to hold on to, but Joshua had to claim strength. The reason that I'm bringing that up is Joshua did not feel strong. In fact, he felt afraid and he felt lost in a sense because the one that he had looked to, Moses, his leader and mentor, had died. And so Joshua was a man in deep grief who was now having to keep going. And God said to him, be strong and courageous. Claim it in that moment. So that's a a, a stake that we can claim. The action we can take is found in this next verse. It says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. That's an action that you can take. If you want to make that claim, I want to be strong. Okay, but then what do I do? It says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. The next verse says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And then the next verse sounds just like the verse that came before. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God. That's exactly what it said in verse 11. And in between verse 11, which says, put on the full armor of God, and verse 13, that says, put on (laughs) the full armor of God, in verse 12, it says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. I wonder how many of us know that or remembered that walking in this morning, that the struggle that you're feeling is not against flesh and blood. The Greek word for that, that struggle, actually uh, uh, most likely means some kind of hand-to-hand combat. And I'm saying that because I don't want you to think of it just as some big war or some big battle that you're a part of. There's actually a struggle that you're in. There is an action that you're supposed to take, okay? You know, some of us, some of you guys like me have a, have a praying mom, right? That's, isn't it wonderful to have a praying mama? Well, there's some things that you have to go in and fight in prayer, okay? It's great to have a praying mama, but this is saying we, you're in a struggle. You're in a battle, hand-to-hand combat. And so that, that means we have to know some things. We have to take some things on. Some of you know what it's like to have a, a pastor who preaches amazing sermons. Amen? You know, is, that's, a, that's an incredible thing to have, you know? That's amazing. But there's some things that can't be accomplished just by hearing an amazing sermon in your spiritual life. Our struggle, it is our struggle, but it's saying it is personal that you have to take on. Our struggle is not against uh, flesh and blood. And this, this guys, is, um, is an insight that will actually wake you up. If you begin walking through your life and realize that every struggle you're in is not just against another person, that's an easy way to look at life. And some of that is true. Some of you are like, my biggest struggle is this guy right next to me, right? You know, you think about these things, these people that are in the midst of our lives, but this is a spiritual insight that's seeking to wake us up to say that there's actually a spiritual battle taking place. And our struggle, if, if we can understand this, it will wake us up. Our struggle in life is actually not against flesh and blood. So here's my three statements for today. Here, here's a claim that you can stake. I am strong. Okay? Here is an action that you can take. 
put on the full armor of God. And then, and then the, the insight that will wake you up is my struggle is not against flesh and blood. I want to walk through those with you. You're like, man, that feels like the end of the sermon. That was great, Jacob. It's not the end, okay? I have a lot more that I want to, to say about it. This insight, we're going to start there on the third thing, this insight that can wake you up. My struggle is not against flesh and blood. If we can understand in our spiritual lives that there is a battle taking place, there is uh, evil that exists, there is an evil one. I, and I know we're like, man, that sounds kind of, that sounds kind of weird. Are, are you sure about that? Let me go over a few phrases that we've been over uh, here before. And they are this, evil is real, the devil is real, and the battle is real. Evil is real, the devil is real, and the battle is real. And some of you are thinking, I don't know, that sounds kind of weird. I don't know if I believe that. I'm not trying to force that belief on you. I'm just trying to uh, ask that we would be opened up to that understanding. It's interesting that sometimes we struggle in believing in evil when the evidence of it is all around us. Yeah, yeah. Violence, oppression, abuse, disease. There's all these things that give us the evidence of it, but we don't really want to talk about it. We don't really want to fool with it. When the Bible is saying this is, our struggle is actually against evil. Our struggle, there is a battle out there that you are in. Not just one for your mom to pray about. Not just one for your preacher to preach about. But for you to wake up and realize that there's a struggle that you're in. I, I, I'm excited about that because it's one of the most positive things that you can hold on to, that you can wake up. I said this is one of my favorite scriptures that I often forget. And then I remember and I remember and I remember that my struggle's not against flesh and blood, that there's actually a battle that I'm engaged in against an evil one. And the evil one, the devil, is not like God. He does not have the power that God has, and he does not have the, the uh, things at his uh, d disposal that God has. But what the devil is, is he is a schemer. Let me show you the verse again. It says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So the devil can't be everywhere all the time. He can't bother you in every moment. He doesn't have power over you, but he is an opportunist. He is working a scheme. You hear what that's saying? The devil is not haphazard. He's methodical. He's tactical. You ever wonder like, man, why does that keep getting to me? Because I believe there's actually evil at work in the world. And the way that evil works is uh, by method, not haphazard. It does not actually have great power over you, but it can feel like it when you wake up and you think, man, this is happening again. And so what we need to, be, to understand, we don't need to know a lot about the devil. I don't talk a lot about the devil here. I don't want to give him a whole lot of press. But we do need to understand his tactics. We do need to begin to understand in our own lives, what are the schemes that I'm being deceived by and tricked by? If you're in battle, you need to know the, the tactics of the one that you're fighting with. Now, listen, I've never been in a fight my whole life. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just ran away from those. I've been hit before, but I've never really been in a fight. So I, I'm not trying to pretend like I know a, a lot about this, but I do understand that you, you, need to, uh, you need to know the tactics of the one that you're fighting with. Uh, there, there's these two little boys they are getting bigger now. My, my best friend, my college roommate, he had these two sons and, and I've, I've known them and been watching them grow up. And every time I'm around them since they were little, we wrestle together, you know? And so I've been wrestling with them since they were little. That's kind of our thing. And they try to get me and one day they're going to get me, right? But right now I can still take both of them at the same time, I think. Um, but recently they were over at the house and, um, we're like in line getting our hot dogs and one of them attached to my leg, you know, I'm like, all right, okay. And then of course the next one's coming. He's on my back. I'm like, dinner will wait for a moment. Right. And so we're, we're wrestling, you know, I'm down there, I'm getting these guys. We're having a, having a big old time and I have no trouble. I'm going to be able to handle both of them. You know, I'm a grown man. I've got this covered. Well, unbeknownst to me, the oldest one, Porter, he had took off his sock, which I think he'd had on for like four months. And he put it around my head in my mouth, like a gag. And all of a sudden, I, I was stunned. Those boys had me. I was in a position I'd never been in. And I realized, I realized I did not know that we were going to employ that tactic that Porter had chosen to fight dirty. And let me just tell you, the evil one fights dirty. And you'll think you're sophisticated and you fought this fight before and you've got it handled, but there will be things that happen that will stun you. And you'll be like, that's the one thing I, I did not want to happen. 
And, and it's, it's got me. And it doesn't mean that the devil has power over you. It just means that he's using a tactic that you didn't see coming. And so the reason we look at these Ephesians chapter 6 verses is not to get all militaristic and think that we're, you know, uh, going to beat people up. But it's to understand what God is showing us in the spiritual realm about how evil operates. And isn't that amazing that God is, is showing that to us. He's opening up our, our eyes to that. And so we think, well, what do I do? What, what's the action that I take? And God says, put on the full armor of God. Here is your protection. And we could do a whole series on these uh, different elements of the armor, but I do want to just go over them with you briefly so you can see them and see how it all begins to fit with the claim that we can stake in our identity as strong people of God. And then uh, the insight that we're being woken up to that we're in a spiritual battle. So let, let's look at what uh, Paul is trying to describe here in Ephesians as a way of a, we can be protected spiritually. I like to start at the top of the head with the, with the armor. This isn't the order that it is in the scripture, but it's how I, how I remember it and how I put it on. So the first thing we're told is that we have a helmet. Isn't that cool? You have a helmet? Okay. What is your helmet? I am saved. And so you can wake up every day if you wanted to put on the full armor of God and say, right now on my head, I'm saved. I'm already saved. It's called the helmet of salvation. And so those who, who know Jesus, who have confessed with their mouth that he's Lord, believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead, we're told are saved. And so every day, every day you can start your day saved <laughs> by wearing it on your head. When we baptize here at Providence so often, we'll take uh, just a little bit of water and put it on forehead with a sign of the cross to mark you. Our baptism is our marker. And, and just imagine if we, we could feel the weight of the helmet of salvation, you know, as we centered ourselves as we started each day. The next thing in the armor that I, as, as we go uh, head to toe, I'm actually going to not even go quite head to toe. It's just the way I like to do it, is the breastplate of righteousness. And so a breastplate is something that covers over your most precious organs. You got all this armor, you've got weapons that you use, but in the ancient armor, there would be a breastplate. And the reason for that is just in case anything gets through, the most important things are covered. And our breastplate is, I am righteous. We're like, what, I am righteous? How's that work? It works because of Christ's righteousness. And so you can go through your day like mine, you're gonna get things wrong. You're gonna have big things in your life that you get wrong, but the righteousness of Christ will cover over you in the most important ways. Christ's righteousness is imparted to us, given to us through his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection. And so we're actually wearing protection every day that we're righteous. And so things will seek to come against that and tell us things that aren't true. And we will have to remember that, no, even though I get things wrong, Christ has made me righteous in God's eyes, which gets to the belt, which I love that God gives us a belt, don't you? Um, maybe not, just me. Uh, the belt is truth. And so around our, our waist is the, is the belt of truth. I preached on this one time in a, a colonel in our uh, our congregation who studied like uh, medieval armor and all that. And he said, Jacob, you know, the belt is what holds all the armor together. It's what all the weapons connect to. It's what keeps you together. And so our belt is truth. We've been talking here at Providence about what's the truth about my life, about who I am. Uh, I've been trying to, to get it into your heads that the truth is you're a dearly loved child of God. You're a child of God and a person of worth. That's the truth. And that holds us all together. That's just part of the truth, but that's one truth that can hold us as we go through our day. My favorite part of the armor, some of y'all know, are the shoes. It says that our feet are fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. What a great statement that our feet are fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. There's no mention of shoes, but it sounds like a great pair of shoes to me. That my shoes would actually be peace. And that every step I could take in the armor of God would be steps of peace. If you're in a battle against people all the time, if your struggle, you don't see it as a struggle against uh, uh, the, the spiritual forces, but it's just against people, your steps will not be peace. And you'll find yourself mad at all kinds of people. You'll be mad at your husband and you'll be mad at your boss and you'll be mad at your friend that doesn't call you and you'll be mad at your, the person in the line in front of you who took too long. You'll be mad at the guy in the big truck who's behind you and he seems like he's too close. And you'll be mad at the Amazon driver who drove through your grass and you'll just go through the day and you'll just be mad, 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 mad. 
You'll be mad at all the people. It's one of the easiest things to do when we forget that we're not spiritual beings. And what we do is we just become flesh and blood beings and flesh and blood beings. Look at the, the account of human history are people who battle and war with each other, who are angry with each other and they hurt each other. But God is giving us a different kind of spiritual armor that says our steps could actually be steps of peace. I'm in a discipleship group here at the church with a group of um, some men that are younger than me. And one of them is a former Marine. And he told me that at one of the times when he was in active duty, they would encourage the, the young men before they went home to their families. They said, take off your Marine uniform or take off your, uh, the, 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 the uniform that you would wear into, into battle. Take that off before you walk into the house. And so just, you, you want to wear something different as you go in because of what you've been doing out here. And so we've been practicing that in our little discipleship group. One of the guys is a physician. He's now taking off his scrubs before he goes home and putting on clothes that will be more like dad or husband. We're trying to think about what is it that we're wearing into the different places that we're wearing. And what I try to do in the garage is think about those shoes of peace. That's where I pull my truck in and there's all these things going on in my house. And I try to, as I'm going up the stairs, I try to think peace, peace. Peace, peace, peace. And then when I walk in and I see my house, it looks like a bomb has exploded in it. It feels a little bit different, right? Because my steps are peace. And whatever may be going on, could I be someone that carries peace in that? What if you did that before you went into work with whatever you might normally be feeling? Well, you'd be thinking about how you're walking. And if you let your steps be peace, 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 peace. This may sound silly, but God has given us a, a spiritual image of this armor that I don't think is silly. I think it's real and I think it shifts the way we look at things and the way that we might enter into our lives. Coming back up into our hands, uh, Paul says that we have the shield of faith. And that shield is able to wield off the arrows of the evil one. And that we actually hold something in our hand. What is it that we hold? Our faith. We're people of faith, and so we walk with our faith like a shield around us every day. And then in the other hand, I picture it said that we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That our weapon is actually God's Word. I hope you see that's what I'm trying to do this morning, is preach the Word of God, to speak the Word of God over you. And that the, the thing that's going to be the, the uh, offensive weapon in our life is going to be God's word. And so you need to read God's word. You need to know God's word. You need to hide it in your heart. Right before I walked up here this morning to preach, I remember a verse from 2 Corinthians that says, Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you, Jacob. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And then Paul says in that verse, therefore I will most gladly boast in my infirmity so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see what that verse is saying? It's saying, it's what I, I feel like when I walk up here to preach. I'm weak. I don't really feel capable of this. I don't know why I'm the one that gets to do it, but I'm going to be strong in the Lord. <laughs> in that weakness. And that verse says that we can boast about our weaknesses so that God's power would be most evident in us. And so I'm just saying that as a way of like, that's one of the verses that I claim in my life that I use as an offensive weapon against the evil one who'd wanna say, you don't need to do that. You got no right to that. You're not gonna be able to do that. Another one I use in the middle of the night, it's from Philippians chapter four. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. It's just a verse that's a weapon that I use against anxiety in the middle of the night. It gets me back to sleep. It gets me back centered. And so we come here, you come here, and we open up the book, right? And it is a weapon against this, uh, these spiritual forces of, of evil that may be happening in our lives. So here is an insight that can wake you up. My struggle is not against flesh and blood. Just think about that this week when you start battling against everybody. Now, there are some battles against people, okay? I'm not trying to say that, um, you know, you may really be mad at your husband, that, that's for sure. I don't want any husbands this afternoon saying, hey, honey, you're not mad at me. Pastor said, you're just mad at the devil, okay? That's, I will not answer your phone call, all right? That's, <laughs> but there, there is a spiritual battle that we're a part of. And when you understand that, you get an insight that can give you great power for your life. Here's an action that you can take. You can put on the full armor of God. I just ran through that with you guys, but we, we teach that to our kids. It, it's something that's easily, to, easily memorizable. If you think about the, the helmet and the breastplate and the belt and the shoes and the, and, the feet and the shield and the sword, right? You can get that. It can be something, maybe you don't need that every day, but there will be moments. There'll be things going on in your life like, I want to put on the full armor of God. And then here is a claim that you can stake. I am strong. 
I want to tell you a story that many of you have heard bef- before, uh, but we do that in the church. We, we tell stories over and over, and this one is about my daughter, Phoebe. I'll make it quick. But some years ago, she didn't like to go to school when she was really little. She just really didn't like school, but we made her go to school, okay? But she didn't like it, and she went to Rutland Elementary over here, and I would drop her big sister off at the big kid place, and we'd pull up to the second level there, and y'all heard me say, Phoebe, we'd come around the corner, and she would say, welcome to the torture chamber, And I would reach back uh, in my hand. I would grab Phoebe's hand. We have a prayer that we pray. Rachel and I wrote it when we were first married. Rachel commuted an hour one way. I commuted an hour another way. We wrote this little prayer and it says, oh, Lord, uh, thank you for this day. We praise you for this day and we praise you for our life. We thank you for our sweet Lord Jesus who gives us passion and purpose. Lead us this day by your Holy Spirit to be committed to you and to each other. Forgive us of our sins and renew us to new life in you. We believe by faith that you alone will sustain us today. Help us to be a light to your people and hold us safe to we're together again. And we pray that with our girls. And I would pray that with Phoebe. And then I would let go of her hand. And then a teacher would open up the door. And Phoebe would, would get out onto the sidewalk. And before she walked into school, she would turn and she would face me. And she would give this almost salute with a wave, no smile on her face as if she was walking into battle. And then she would walk away from me. And in second grade one day, Phoebe's teacher, uh, Rachel got a call from the school and it was Phoebe on the other side of the phone. You don't expect your second grader to be on the other side of the phone, but her teacher had let her call her mom. And Rachel said, three more hours, baby, you can make it. You're brave, you're strong, you're known. You're loved. Now, why did that teacher let that little girl call her mom? So that she would come get her? No. So that she would remind her of who she is. And that's what God is doing us, doing with us through his word over and over and over. And in this scripture about this great spiritual battle against evil, powers and principalities, God's speaking to each one of his children and saying, be strong in the Lord. He's saying, you can claim that right now. Not that it's something coming. You know, I feel like God's saying to us sometimes, just a few more hours. You are brave, you are strong, you are known, and you are loved. And so as we step out of this New Year series with this great cosmic verse of waking up to what God wants to do, I want us to remember who we are, strong in the Lord. The action that we can take is to put on the armor every day. And the spiritual insight that God is showing us is that we actually are a part of something much bigger than we can oftentimes see, but we're protected because of Jesus. Let us pray. God, I pray you just let some of these scriptures and uh, verses sink into our hearts and our minds now, that you would show us more of who you are as we come to communion that you would give a special grace and peace to your church as we gather. We pray that this uh, bread and juice would become for us the body and blood of Christ, his righteousness given to us, his salvation, his forgiveness has made us alive. And so in this simple act of communion, God, we pray that you would work miracles in our lives as we receive Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.